Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name, is, uh, my name is Steve Bordeaux. I'm the development director at the SETI Institute, and I just want to welcome you all here uh, this evening to the SETI Talks. How many of you are here for the first time by show of hands? That's awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome. Every month, um, you know, we try to gather uh, the thought leaders from the field of SETI and space sciences as part of uh, the SETI Institute's Center for Outreach Programs. Um, we really enjoy that we're able to um, attract such a diverse and eager group uh, to expand your understanding of why and how we explore uh, life beyond Earth. Uh, while we, um, I know we're all very different people, but we all share uh, one thing in common at some point, and I guarantee, I, I, I'm absolutely certain that at some point in everyone's life, Probably when you were a child, you sat on the front porch, you laid down on the lawn, you looked up from your campsite uh, at the stars and, it, you know, in awe and, and wondered, are, are we alone? Every single one of you, uh, I'm sure, had that moment in your life. And so I just invite you to relive that for a moment. Um, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit research institute based in Mountain View, and uh, we're, renowned, we're a renowned group of more than 100 scientists, all leaders in their field, and 30, uh, uh, more than 30 staff who for nearly 35 years have pursued uh, one mission, to explore, understand, and explain the nature and origins of life in the universe and the evolution of intelligence. Our Center for Outreach and Education promotes science literacy and STEM education through numerous programs and initiatives that take advantage of the excitement generated by space science and exploration. Uh, we're able to hold these events in large part due to the support of people just like you. If you support the SETI Institute, we thank you. Uh, if you don't, we hope you'll join Team SETI and go home and go to SETI.org tonight uh, before you go to bed and make a gift. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce your moderator um, of this evening's forum, Molly Bentley. If you don't recognize Molly, uh, you'll surely recognize her voice. Um, Molly is the co-host and producer of Big Picture Science, the radio show and podcast of the SETI Institute. And welcome, Molly. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to introduce the guests on stage. Lori Marino is a neuroscientist, and she has studied dolphins and whales for 25 years. She has co-authored a study that offered the first ev evidence of mirror recognition in bottlenosed dolphins. She has appeared in the documentary Blackfish about orcas in captivity, and she is president of the Whale Sanctuary Project, and she was director of science with the Non-Human Rights Project. Lori, thank you for being with us. Lawrence Doyle is a pr principal investigator for the SETI Institute. He is the director of the Quantum Astrophysics Group there. He has studied animal communication in many animals, but with a focus on humpback whales. And he is notable for his application of information theory to look for patterns in animal communication. Welcome, Lawrence. <laughs> And so, um, Lori and Lawrence are each going to give a brief presentation to outline their ideas, and then we'll follow up with some questions from me, and then questions from you, we hope. And there'll be a microphone, either a wandering microphone or a microphone over here, so you'll be thinking about the questions that you might want to ask later in the program. And uh, Lori, let's start with you. Okay, can I have the first slide? Well, my only slide. There we go, okay. Well, I was told that I have five minutes to speak, and I am very happy to be here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so the theme of this is uh, intelligence, mundane or miracle? So the question is, uh, what is the answer to that, and is there an answer to that? So all of you know that the SETI Institute has adopted the Drake Equation, as a way to estimate the number of technological civilizations that might exist in our galaxy. Um, and in that equation, there's a particular factor, the factor of F sub i. 
And that factor is the fraction of life-bearing planets on which intelligence might arise. Well, uh, when we estimate that factor, F sub i, what we normally do is we think of human intelligence and the fact that we seem to be the only intelligence on this planet. Um, so intelligence is thought to be quite rare in these estimates. But I want to take a step back from that uh, assumption and show why this is not the most helpful view for the SETI Institute, nor for astrobiology, um, and is really a non-starter when it comes to a scientific investigation of this question. Um, let's start with the working definition of intelligence. The ability to take in information, process it, and act accordingly. Now, if we go with that basic definition of intelligence, um, we also realize that intelligence needs a substrate. It needs some material substance that does this kind of thing. Um, so we can look at things like nerve cells and brains and look at the evolution of brains as a way to tell us about the evolution of intelligence. So there are two or three important events or developments in the evolution of intelligence on Earth that tell us that the landscape of intelligence on Earth is much deeper and much richer than the study of astrobiology might even acknowledge that human intelligence is certainly not uh, a, a miracle. So if you turn to the slide here, um, this is a slide that shows a number of different organisms. And um, the initial organism, single-celled organism in the center there. And uh, basically, the three, the three yellow circled uh, organisms are the ones I want to focus on as major developments or transitions in nervous systems and intelligence on this planet. So the first one up top there are single-celled organisms. That was the first major event. So you can imagine how far that goes, maybe three and a half billion years. And the thing that's special about single-celled organisms is they have membranes. And these membranes are able to react to the environment. And it turns out that that's very important because the way they react to the environment, since their environment is exactly the same way that the neurons in our brains do the same thing. So there's a continuity there. So right off the bat, 3.5 billion years ago, we have the basis of intelligence. The second event was multicellularity. And with that comes cell specialization. And you see uh, up there this little squiggly organism. This is an aquatic organism known as a hydra. And the hydra has nerve cells very similar to the nerve cells in our brains. And they, that emerged 600 million years ago. On the third event was the first brains. And the first brains appeared about 500 million years ago in this guy, this funny looking little flatworm called a planaria. This guy is a big deal. And the reason he's a big deal is because this guy was the first brain on the planet. He has a full brain. It's a bilaterally symmetrical brain. He's got everything that makes up a brain. So basically, after that, all brains are a variation on a theme. Insect brains, invertebrate brains, and of course, uh, vertebrate brains. Um, so my point is, is that if we really want to take seriously the study of evolution and the distribution of intelligence uh, through astrobiology and SETI, we really need to reject the view that intelligence is rare and embrace the overall picture of intelligence as a common, ubiquitous characteristic of almost all life on Earth. 
Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Now, I should say that, Lawrence, you saw him pull out his phone. I can verify that he was not texting. He was using it as a mirror to read the uh, slide behind him. So he was with the program. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Well, um, it's my, yeah, here we go. So uh, my basic approach, uh, taking a cue from astrobiology, which um, basically the study of astrobiology seems to get to blue-green algae and then doesn't want to go any farther as far as supporting like complex, the study of complex organisms which lead to SETI. But I nevertheless took a cue from them. Uh, for example, they use Antarctica as a proxy for Mars. And they study extreme environments, hot springs and so on, as a possible origin of life. And so, you know, maybe the deep sea vents are a proxy for Europa. So they basically study extreme environments on Earth to try and use an analogy for designing spacecraft to go to like a Europa orbiter, for example. So I took a cue from that, and the basic idea was that, you know, we show an astronomer looking up at space and saying, are we alone? And there's a bottlenose dolphin down here going, hable espanol and parlez-vous francais, and, you know, everybody's seen the cartoon. But that's true. We have a million languages or more on planet Earth that we could study. So how do you begin studying them as a proxy for an extraterrestrial signal? Well, one of the safe ways to do it, I think, is, well, you can look in a dolphin's eyes or you can look at a humpback whale and say, wow, we know they're intelligent. And that's our deep intuition telling us the direction to go, which scientists need. But if you want to publish a paper on these sort of things, you need something robust. So what is a pragmatically robust mathematical definition of intelligence? Well, one kind of intelligence is complexity. And that equation you see up there is basically the first order entropy, and it's called information mathematics, and it was invented by Bell Labs by a guy named Claude Shannon, who introduced the term bit, which we all are familiar with. Well, it came from information theory. And it's a way of measuring how much information different species are sending back and forth to each other. And so we started this analysis with my colleague Brenda McCowan and Sean Hanser uh, a couple decades ago, and we've been applying it to all these critters, including on the right here, you'll see a cotton plant and a wasp. And I've analyzed a one-way chemical communication system it's air traffic control signal from a cotton plant to a wasp telling it whether a worm or a caterpillar landed on it. And when it sends out the caterpillar, the wasp goes and lands on those plants and not the worm ones. And this is after all the worms and caterpillars have been taken away in the dead leaves. So it's a purely chemical communication system and it tells the wasp where to land. So here's an inner, not just inner species, this is an inner kingdom communication system. And it makes you, if you get the idea, well, if a cotton plant can talk to a wasp, everybody must be talking with everybody, and that's true. <laughs> On the other hand, what we're emphasizing for now, because they put most of their information into a audio signal. People say, why don't you study chimpanzees? Because chimpanzees don't not only make audio signals, but they have gestures and facials like we do. Okay, well maybe Jane Goodall can sort that out. But for us, we started with, okay, a complex communication system, a global communicator, and humpback whales use bubble nets to catch herring, so tool use, long distance. They, have a, they had the internet millions of years before we did. And so we were picking humpback whales. They're also pristine. We started with bottlenose dolphins, but they were captive. And if really, if you want a pristine system, humpback whales, <coughs> excuse me, humpback whales are a good guess, uh, a good place to start because they have a global communication system and they don't really care when they're making bubble nets that we have a boat nearby. It's up to us to get out of the way when they come up with their mouths open. <laughs> So the basic idea of all this is there's lots of languages to be studied and it will be applied to SETI in what we are calling an intelligence filter. 
One quick example of an intelligence filter, a quick look, is called a ZIF plot, Z-I-P-F. And George Ziff was a linguist, and he basically plotted the frequency of occurrence of signals in order, in rank order. First, most frequently, second, third, fourth, and it made a 45 degree slope. And this is considered a language indicator. Other things can make the 45 degree slope, and then you have to look further into information theory to confirm a language. But if it doesn't make a 45 degree slope, it's not a language. It could be a code, you have to fiddle with it, but the bottom line is that human languages obey this 45 degree frequency of occurrence slope on a logarithmic plot. Well, mathematically, that's how you characterize whether you have a language. So we plotted bottlenose dolphins. Uh, and they have, a 40, they have a 45 degree minus one slope. Mm. So we were the first to discover that. So then we plotted babies, human babies, <laughs> flat. <laughs> well, they're babbling. That means there isn't any knowledge transmission going on per se, at least from their sounds. Uh, babies communicate in other ways besides sounds. But. So then we, two baby bottlenose dolphins were born at Marine World and we recorded them and they landed right on babbling. Mm. And we watched them by about 18 months, they obeyed Ziff's law again. So we watched them learn their whistle language. They're born babbling and they learn their communication system. And so we applied that to other critters and ground squirrels do not obey Ziff's law. <laughs> uh, orcas, looks like they do, we need more data. Humpback whales do. Uh, squirrel monkeys, not quite Ziff's law. But anyway, so we have a system for a first quick look. You could call that an intelligence filter. If we get a signal from SETI, what SETI does now, and has done for 50 years, is they say, is there a transmitter out there? And what they do is if you tune onto a radio station, you turn the dial, you're on a new station. If you tune to a OH Maser in a galaxy, that's the narrowest that nature can do is 300 turns. In other words, 300 hertz. So if you tune onto a galaxy and say, is this SETI? Well, you have to turn the knob and be on a new station. Then it's technology. If you have to turn it 300 times, then you've, you've detected an OH maser, which is just a gas cloud. So SETI said to themselves, we're going to use narrow band carrier wave, and we're going to ask the question, is there a transmitter? So SETI is done right now at about 0.9 hertz. But they only ask, answer the question, is there technology? So the definition of intelligence from, from classical SETI is the ability to build a radio telescope. But I wonder if we can leave it there oh, a just bit. Oh, you one more thing. Okay, okay. That is, an intelligence filter allows us to receive the whole signal and analyze the message. <laughs> if I'd only waited, you know, That's okay. five more seconds. Now, I know that you have some um, recordings of whales, and let's hold off on that a little bit because we'll come around. I want to step back and ask uh, more about intelli intelligence generally, but you heard some of the themes that are coming out here. What, some of the measures of intelligence, brains, and then also complex communication, and we're going to come back to that. Um, but let's step back, because being an intelligent species here on the, here on the stage tonight, uh, we want to define our focus and, and talk a little bit more about what intelligence is, and, and you've given us an introduction. Um, if we look in the animal kingdom, which is what we're focused on here tonight, are there any um, behaviors among animals that look intelligent, but they don't necessarily mean that the animal is intelligent? Well, uh, that's a difficult question to answer because typically when something looks intelligent, the, in, the individual doing that is intelligent. Now, we can think of many examples uh, where we might consider certain uh, animals, like for instance, you mentioned the bowerbird when we were talking earlier, yeah. building this extraordinary uh, house, this nest, uh, to attract females. Well, that's clearly intelligent. Does, that doesn't mean the bowerbird is an architect or has um, all of the understanding of, of, of what 
you know, constructing an, ob an object is that somebody else might have. But yeah, it's clearly intelligent. I think we really have to get away from this either or. You know, either it's intelligent or it's not intelligent. That doesn't exist in nature. Uh, what exists in nature are just different dimensions and variations on a theme and everything that interacts with the, with the environment is intelligent. And the question is not, is it or isn't it? It's just, how is it intelligent? So you're really broadening this um, definition of intelligence. I am. Because yeah. if we look out into the animal kingdom, um, animals do amazing things all the time. Mm -hmm. And so you're, what you're suggesting, it sounds like, and we'll see if Lawrence agrees, is that we're actually surrounded by intelligence of varying degrees. Absolutely. Different kinds of intelligence. Um, well, then, Lawrence, I'll ask you this, because I know this is something that um, it, you're, you're passionate about answering. Is human intelligence the metric, or has it always been the metric by which um, we measure uh, other intelligence? All other intelligence has been measured. I mean, does the definition has it always traditionally begun with us? I, I think we have that, and it could be an unconscious prejudice as well, but over the last 100, 150 years, the human body was considered completely apart from any other species. We magically appeared without any connection to any other species on Earth, <laughs> and that's been disproven with genetics and DNA and so on, that we're quite connected to the rest of you know, we're 70% oak trees. Uh, we share genetic structure and so on. 75% pumpkins, I think, too. Oh, we are? Oh, there you go. Oh, dear. I'm not going to pick the pumpkin. <laughs> yeah, so. they'll make us think twice when you uh, start carving them at Halloween, huh? Yeah. Well, we're kind of in the middle of a similar prejudice, and that is that the human communication system comes from nowhere, is totally superior, obeys Ziff's law, no other species does. That came as quite a surprise to the linguistics community. We sent them our dolphin paper. And um, so we have to deprovincialize our communication estimate or how we measure intelligence in form of communication because as far as SETI goes, communication intelligence is the kind of intelligence we're likely to receive first. And a proxy for that is complexity in the signal. And when we look at <clears throat> other species, we find a continuity, like Lori said, of there's no such thing as a sudden cutoff where humans are intelligent and other species aren't. And I was told that animals didn't use tools. And I'd go down to the beach. I grew up on a dairy farm near the beach. And there's um, otters getting rocks and banging away at abalone, and it's like, isn't isn't that a tool? <laughs> so this is kind I, of an otter body experience for you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Just get one pun out of the way. Now you're no free good. for the rest I'm glad of the you night. Did that. <laughs> Yes. So that gives us permission. To <laughs> is that what it does? Okay. <laughs> so the bottom line is that it's interesting. Lori's finding the same thing as this this age right now when we're discovering a continuity. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, indigenous peoples already knew that there was this continuity. They talk about the ant people or the tree nations, and they meant it. Can I ask you a, a really speculative question? Um, uh, if we're assuming that human intelligence is different, at least, a different kind of intelligence, and that there's a lot of intelligence out there. Um, if animals, all animals, had the same kind of intelligence that we have, um, would we cooperate? Would we all cooperate together, or would we fight? Uh, I mean, could be more, more being, options. You mean? Everything around us. So if they all had the, the, oh. the bees and the dolphins. You mean if they were all great apes like us? And if they all had our kind of intelligence at our level and not, not diversity of intelligence. I can't imagine <laughs> things would be anything but completely chaotic given, <laughs> given our intelligence. I mean, we're great apes. Um, and if you know anything about chimpanzees, um, our closest relatives, uh, they're very territorial, they're very us versus them, and of course they don't have, you know, the, a way to do as much damage as we do, but we, we are the chimpanzee with the big gun, or the big this or that, and so, 
to, to even think about uh, us uh, feeling, uh, being, you know, it, it, put it this way, we're already destroying every, every species on the planet. If they actually fought back, um, then it would, then, I mean, it, just things would go a lot quicker, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, one other general question about intelligence, and then we'll start talking brains and, uh, and communication more in depth. But um, we're now recognizing that animals have complex emotional lives. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if emotional intelligence is a, a kind of intelligence by itself, or if it is a product of intelligence. Well, Maybe I'll say something and then you'll say something. I think emotion, you know, it's interesting. Emotions, emotions are the basis of intelligence. And the reason I mm. say that is because if you really deconstruct brains, nervous systems, and look at what are the most conserved parts of brains? Well, it's not the part that does calculus. It's not the part that figures problems out. It's not any of that. It's not even the communication part. It's the part that gives you feelings. Without feelings, you have no motivations and no moat or movement. And so therefore, feelings, um, emotions are the basis of intelligence on this planet for mobile organisms, um, which are our most organisms. So it's not separate from intelligence. I think it is the foundation of intelligence. I like that you're, you're emphasizing the motion and emotion. It's, well, it's exactly. A, it's, a, it's a driving... I mean, that emotion is about the fact that you are reacting to something. Um, people who have damage to the part of the brain that processes emotions um, not only have problems feeling, uh, but they, they can't make a decision. They can't do anything. And the reason is because they don't have any feelings to go by in terms of making their decisions. That's how we actually do make our decisions. So it's really fundamental. And every organism, uh, every vertebrate uh, and every invertebrate, well, invertebrates have a, a certain type of part of the brain. But every vertebrate on this planet has the same system to process emotions. And it's called the limbic system. Everybody's got one, and there's a reason for that. Oh, that's a teaser because that may come. We're going to come back to that. But Lawrence, do you see a display of emotion, or could you describe some of the emotions that you've you've witnessed in your study of humpback whales? Well, um, yeah, we've uh, we did some experiments this few months ago, and we played two kinds of calls. One's a contact call called a whoop, and whenever we played it twice, uh, the humpbacks would contact us. So we know, we think we know what that means. Wait, means they would contact to, you. How would they contact you? They'd whoop back. <laughs> and oh. then they'd make it, you know, decrease the distance between us. Yeah. So we know how to say hello and hump back. Um, but we also played a feeding call. And they came over from about a kilometer away, and there wasn't any food. <laughs> and it's like somebody said there was food here. And, you know, if they could yeah. tap their foot at us, they would have. <laughs> And so we tried that once more, and they were upset. There's no two ways about it. <laughs> I've seen, I'll just say one more incident. So we've seen humpback whales get together in groups and make bubble nets, and they catch herring in the nets and then come up with their mouths open. So it's a cylindrical net. They get underneath and come up with their mouths open. And um, every now and then, about 10% of the time, a bubble net fails. Somebody messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and they rise to the surface without lunging, and all sorts of racket breaks out. Like, I was there, where were you? And it's very clear that that's what's going on. I, we have to figure out a way to quantify that, but yep, and we saw two guys fill with water and push this third guy away. You are drummed out of the bubble netters guild. <laughs> Go and learn to bubble net and don't come back till you know what you're doing. Eat krill. So you can project emotions on animals, but it was so obvious everybody in the boat laughed when they started arguing. I was there, where were you? <laughs> so instead of a knitting circle, it's a netting circle. 
I, that is really the last one. There, it's out of my system now. That's not the last okay. one. Okay, let's, let's, let's come back to brains, brains. Okay. So, um, and more on communication, this is great. So, um, <laughs> thanks, Lawrence. <laughs> he just, under his breath, he said, that was funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, a natural way, as Laurie has pointed out, to look at whether or not an animal is intelligent is to look at its brain. Um, and you say that there are a couple things we look at. You look at size, you look at complexity, and um, and that we have made really surprising discoveries in the complexity of orca brains. Mm -hmm. What have we discovered? Well, uh, orca brains, killer whale brains are... Uh, enormously complex and large. Uh, and what we've discovered is some of the features that we think are so special about brains, because we have them, are exceeded by orcas. So for instance, uh, let's take a, an example of our neocortex, the outer layer of our, our brain. Uh, it's really wrinkled, and we think that is Fantastic, right? We think, well, it's really wrinkled because you know we've had to uh, stuff a lot of neocortex in our skulls, and that's why we're really smart, and we have the most wrinkled or convoluted neocortex of all the primates, and on and on and on. Well, when you look at the, uh, the wrinkles on the surface, of dolphin and whale brains, and in particular orcas, they're much more wrinkled or gyrified than ours. Um, I actually brought something that will help illustrate, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> let's say this is this, this is oh bubble wrap. Um, this is surface. Let's just say this is surface area of a okay. brain. Can you work with okay. this and show us what you mean? Do you always I think carry you can. <laughs> You never okay, know. Well, but this is a really good bubble wrap. I promise I won't pop them because it's very hard not to. Um, so to, to show those convolutions, they're also called convolutions. So, you know, if you took that wrinkled gray part off the neocortex and you s spread it out, it would be a sheet like this. And then what happens over evolutionary time, as you know, is, is that if more and more and more of this has to evolve, but it has to stay inside a skull that doesn't change, then the only way to get this in this is to go like this, right? Mm -hmm. It's to squish it up and make a ball, and then you have that sheet all in a ball and it could fit in here, right? And so it, it, this has many more convolutions on the surface uh, because you're trying to fit more tissue in the skull. So that's the, the, the reason why we think convolutions on the surface are a big deal. It means that over evolutionary time in that species, there was a need to increase the amount of neocortex in that, in that animal. Well, we, again, um, cetaceans, uh, have a, a somewhat different neocortex than ours, but the point is, is that if we're looking at something like gyrification of the number of wrinkles with surface area of the neocortex, orcas have a speed. Um, they also have a speed in one other really important way, and that is, so we, should probably we, could, we could save that for Christmas. <laughs> um, I'll take it. So it's, we don't have recording, we just... Um, um, they have us beaten another way. So our brains have different parts, right? And there's the forebrain, and then there's the hindbrain, and the midbrain, and there's a certain, the cerebrum is the part of our brain that does thinking. So again, it's the part of the brain that's involved in what we consider to be intelligence. And if you look at the cerebrum as a proportion of the whole brain in humans, it's pretty, pretty up there. Well, guess what? You look at it in orcas, it's even more. What that means is that orcas have a greater amount, a proportion of their brain devoted to thinking than we do. And you'll use They're the word. More, you, and it's called you'll use the word thinking. You use the word thinking. Was that? You will use the word thinking. Sure. Sure, I mean, that is, the cerebrum does the thinking, the hindbrain does, and the hindbrain makes sure you stay alive, right, and, and keep breathing and, and so forth, but it's the cerebrum that does the thinking, and 
in a, a very uh, objective scientific way, orcas are more cerebral than humans. That's, that's, a, that's a stunning um, discovery, yeah, really. it is. It is. <laughs> so you have these, these um, orca brains, which are more convoluted, they have more wrinkles than, mm -hmm. than the human brain does, yeah. which is a measure of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Why do they need that intelligence? Why do they need um, all of that surface area? Oh, gosh, their lives are so complex. They have cultural traditions, just like we do. Complex communication, as Lawrence talks about. Um, they are travel, they, they live in a dynamic environment. Um, orcas uh, are socially very complex, just as many, many other dolphins and whales are. It seems to be that it's that social complexity that was one of the possible drivers of the of brain evolution in dolphins and whales, because they started out to be pretty ordinary land animals. And when they adopted an aquatic lifestyle, um, their brains remained pretty small. And it wasn't until about 30 million years ago that something changed in their social ecology. And with that change came a tremendous ballooning of their brain. Um, so orca and dolphin and whale brains seem to be big, complex brains um, because of the social complexity of their lives. So socialization and complex socialization is a manifestation of intelligence. Yes. Um, and a driver. And the driver. Yeah, like and the driver. Well, that brings us to communication, because if you have a social, a complex social relationship, you know, you want to communicate. And um, I, you've been studying the, the, the complex communication of humpback whales, and it, it, my understanding is that it's actually more complex than we believe, than even you believed. And you've yeah. been spending a lot of time with these whales. Give us an overview of just how complex is their well, communication, and what kinds of communication do these animals make? Well, uh, they have to coordinate tool making. And like the they, bubble nets. Yeah, an mm -hmm. average, uh, say you dwell in your home and you spend a lot of time in the bedroom and in the kitchen. Well, humpback whales, that they're like we're hanging around home today is a few square miles. And they'll travel, you know, 50 miles if they want to. And so they just inhabit a larger environment. And they have three-dimensional environment, too. They have depth, whereas we pretty much are two-dimensional most of the time. Mm -hmm. So they also have to communicate with each other in a very SETI-like problem. And that is they send a signal, and it may take several hours to reach 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 kilometers. We know that blue whales communicated from pole to pole before the five hertz uh, super tanker propeller interfered with that communication system. Blue whales could talk to anybody on the planet. So humpback whales also have this global internet kind of communication system. And if they want to meet up with somebody, it could take hours to get a signal and it could take a month, weeks to a month to actually come in contact. Well, that's a problem we're gonna have when we start to inhabit the solar system. So maybe NASA would be interested in how another species solved it that is waiting several hours is not exactly a conversation, but it's not exactly a one-way transmission either. And then several, you know, maybe a month to actually get in contact. So humpback whales have a very complex uh, system of communication. I'll give you a quick example. And then let's hear some, let's hear some of them. I know everyone wants to hear the whales. Well, we, um, we recorded humpback whales in the presence of boat noise and in the absence of boat noise. And we could calculate with the boat noise how much the channel, the communication channel, remember information theory was invented by Bell Labs, and so we said boat noise is static and Glacier Bay is the phone line. And humpbacks are the callers. And so we can actually calculate with this much static how much you have to slow down your communication rate. Now that you want to say, I'm going to say the Gettysburg Address and it'll take a minute. And you say, well, no, it's going to take three minutes because when I picked up the phone, it was going <laughs> OK? So you have to slow down your transmission so there's more power in each word. Well, humpbacks weren't slowing down by how much they needed to. The noise was this much, 
but the humpback whales only slowed down 62% of that. And it took, us a, uh, it took me a week or two to figure that out. And I went down and made a copy, and the copier was low on toner. And I got back to my office, and there were missing words and letters, so I just filled them in. I go, the humpback whales are filling in the missing words. And they can do that only if they have syntax, that is grammar, some kind of structure. Well, why would they do that? Well, because error recovery helps survival. It's really important they get the message. So they developed um, error recovery. They fill in the missing letters and words. And we wrote a paper on that. Do they have words? Well, they have phonemes. Mm -hmm. How would I put it that way? Okay. Let's, let's listen to some <laughs> of your, the sounds that you have because okay. you have them all different The first lines. sound is going to be loud. And what it is is an astrophysical source you don't want to mistake for SETI. So I looked at the most complex star I could find, star type, and then they originally discovered they were called LGMs for little green men. Mm -hmm. And they're really a pulsar. The bottom here shows a pulsar. It's the result of a supernova. And so hopefully this isn't too loud. Let's do the pulsar. Is that an intelligent signal? Well, we did Ziff's law, and we didn't get a minus one slope. We got a minus 0 0.3 slope, thank goodness. <laughs> so Ziff's law indicates that a pulsar is not, that is not a language. How about this one? Is that an Just intelligent incredible. signal? Lovely. Uh, and there are lots of sounds in there, distinct sounds. Yeah, I have folders that say humpback sounding like a wolf, humpback sounding like a chimp, humpback sounding like a human. I'll play a human one for you. We were in the boat, and the humpbacks... Uh, it could be the first attempt of a non-human to communicate with humans in human. Uh, so let's do a couple more humpback sounds and um, then we'll get to the humpback sounding like a human. Which sounds like us talking underwater. Okay. Guess, now if you heard that, what would you name that whale? We named him Miles. Oh. Miles Davis. Next one. He's a humpback whale. Now, if you heard that in the boat, uh, Fred and Brenda and I were like, what? <laughs> Is this like candid camera? What's going on? It's like, okay, first of all, if we're trying to talk underwater when you were a kid, oh, 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 oh. That's what it sounds like, and that's what we would sound like from 100 feet under the boat. So first of all, everybody shut up, quit talking. But I think that was an attempt to reach us in our frequency at our tempo. It sounded to me, if I had to guess, that that was an imitation of human. So we may have had the first attempt at contact for us from non-humans. So that would be an example, if you're right, um, we have no reason to doubt you, of cross-species communication. Yeah, it certainly communicated to us. We recognize it as in our frequency, at our tempo. Well, just and so... Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. I just got, let's do one more. Okay, oh, yeah, so yeah, there's more. Now, that's the sound they make when they've been bubble netting all day and they decide to go... For, it's sun setting and they head and 
all different directions and keep breaching. I'm here, I'm here. It reminded me of when we were little, you know, my friend and I would play and I'd say, goodbye, and he'd say, goodbye, 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 because <laughs> you didn't want to go home in the dark by yourself. Bye, okay, and we jump in the door. <laughs> well, humpback whales do that. Uh, Fred uh, Sharp of the Alaska Whale Foundation calls that the farewell ceremony. And uh, the bubble netters meet again the next day, and they're bubble netting and catching herring and all, but that's how they say goodbye. They make that sound. So that may mean goodbye. We don't know. Translating humpback into human is tricky. We only know maybe one or two dolphin whistles, what they mean, and we only know one or two or three humpback whale sounds. And, and what they're saying is, is um, packaged in information packets. Yes. That's right. Yes. So that's why you have to, it's like a zip drive or something yes. that you have to open up. Exactly it. If, yeah. you, mm-hmm. if you zip a file, you're using information theory. Well, so then this gets to the big picture of um, in, intelligent life or finding intelligent life um, elsewhere in the universe. Um, if we are listening for signals, intelligent signals, or signals that suggest intelligence elsewhere in the universe, we cannot assume, to state the obvious, we cannot assume that it's going to sound like human language. Even right. one of the, 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 did you say a million languages that humans, oh, that we speak? there may be yeah. more than that. It yeah. might sound like that. And so it would be very easy to miss that and dismiss it as noise. Exactly. So, but if you did the information content, you'd see that it has structure, and it obeys this law, and you can start looking for syntactical relationships, and you go, this is a structured communication system, Mm -hmm. and you can assign how many bits that is, and you can assign what the structure is, and you can compare that structure as one measure of intelligence with um, other species, which has the most structure, structural communication intelligence, B-dance, or orca whistles. Well, hopefully someday we'll know enough about information theory we can tell and make a hierarchy, a kind of an encephalization quotient based on communication complexity, maybe, so we could know right away how complex a system. And so what can you do with that? You can translate eventually if you have enough common symbols. So information theory doesn't answer the question, what are they saying directly? It answers the question, could Shakespeare ever be translated into humpback? In other words, can, does humpback have the caring capacity to take human texts, or vice versa? And the we complexity also, of thought that comes with it, and the exactly. complexity of um, symbolism. I mean, there's a high degree of symbolism in, yeah. in yes. human language. Well, yeah. uh, coming uh, again to the, to the focus in this idea of um, trying to find intelligent life elsewhere, Laurie, um, just to restate, just so we're clear, why it's important to study intelligence on this planet in order to understand whether it be elsewhere in the universe. Mm-hmm. Because it seems that now what you're revealing is it comes with a big caveat. You have to be able to communicate off off your planet Mm -hmm. for us to be able to pick up that signal. Mm -hmm. So why does it matter to us whether or not there's a planet somewhere, although other than we love to imagine this, there's a planet where there are alien, the the equivalent of of whales and of maybe bees and uh, wolves that having all this complex communication with each other and all displaying, you know, uh, diverse intelligence. But we can never hear that. We can never pick up those signals. So why does it matter? Well, it matters because whether we can hear them or not is a practical matter. Um, we, that's what we can do right now is, is use, uh, use our technology to detect other technology. But that's a practical uh, issue, um, in my view. Um, the, the richer issue is, um, is what is out there? Who is out there? Um, and whether or not they construct technology for us to, to detect is, is quite another issue. Uh, if we want to know if we're alone uh, in the universe, uh, we can look around on our own planet. But if we found uh, organisms on other planets in other ways uh, that didn't have technology but were still behaving, and uh, to me, that would, would answer the question right there. So the important thing is, to get to the point where you're building a telescope and transmitting a signal, 
um, you, you've got to evolve. And that evolution comes out of a long uh, evolutionary history of biology on this planet. The human brain did not just pop up. Um, Although this one did. Oh, I was, right. <laughs> I mean, the, right. Orca, the orca brain did right, actually just right. pop up. Yeah. But you're not going to get there if you don't understand how something as complex as a humpback whale brain or a human brain, um, what the context is for how it evolves. Um, and that's why it's important to study single-celled organisms and that planaria guy. Planaria is the key, the isn't it? The planaria guy, he's pretty cool. Because um, he was the first, first organism with a brain, right? He's not got, yeah, he's yeah. the first organism. And so you're pretty much there once you get to a planaria, planarium. And um, what's interesting is to think, is to understand and really appreciate that because it gives you some, something to study in astrobiology rather than just saying, well, the human brain is just so amazing and there's nothing like it and what do you do with that? Nothing. So, well, I'm right. guessing that everyone, ha or at least some people, have some questions. And are we? Do we have a floating mic while you think of your questions? Is that Linda raised there? Okay. While you think of those, you hold up your hand. Someone do. Um, let me ask you. Uh, just no. You know. Let's take a, Let's take a, someone else's question first. But I do have another big question to ask. Uh, I think there's a gentleman here. And I may ask um, Lori and Lawrence to just repeat the question to make sure that everybody can hear it. And just one piece of advice is to lift the uh, microphone up a little higher. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dalton from the Nova School, so I'll see you there tomorrow. Thank you. Um, I really enjoy this a lot. It's, um, my mind is just uh, <laughs> uh, going crazy when I think about this stuff. But I'm thinking about uh, Darwin. When he wrote about intelligence, he kind of framed it as instinct, right? And I'm wondering, is complexity of intelligence limited to the environment? He was comparing wasps and honeybees, but honeybees have those really efficient uh, honeycombs. Wasps have really messy honey, um, you know, combs that are not efficient, but that's as good as they need it to be. Um, so is complexity limited to natural selection? Do you want to go first? Don't you? So the question is, is complexity limited to the process of natural selection? And, and, and I, I, I think so, although what would be the alternative in your mind? Uh, something that goes beyond what they really need. Oh, I see. Oh. I see. So can complexity go beyond what, just like an emergent property or something like that? Um, I actually don't think so. Just knowing how expensive brains are metabolically, um, you know, the old adage, you only use 10% of your brain. Well, that's just not true. You use 100% all the time. Uh, and uh, if we only use 10%, we'd have 10% of the brain. Um, so I think that um, most things are a product of uh, natural selection, although it might not be clear why, you know, what the connection is. I mean, the ability to do calculus, for instance, was not selected for, but there is an underlying uh, capacity there that was selected for. So. Yeah, I would say uh, we talked about this. Uh, bacteria have 100 trillion generations, and we wonder if there's a phase change where, like a phase change similar to human evolution has kind of suddenly uh, tools took the place of adapting biologically. So, and we've gone to the moon with tools, not by adapting to radiation in space and so on. Mm -hmm. So it speeded up the process. And, you know, we are, what, a few million years ahead of chimps that are chipping sticks and, and different ravens <coughs> use sticks to get bugs and whatever. It's like. Uh, tool use is around the corner for several species, uh, around the corner meaning a few million years. So, but we are the current, you know, tool users. And, uh, but I think that is a, uh, it is an ergodic change in the 
uh, evolution process to then adapt using tools. So that's a phase change, and that could have happened. Most stars in the solar neighborhood are much older than the sun. So, and we are a third generation star from the metallicity and so on. So, you know, we should look for these fundamental changes that are not necessarily driven by biological adaptation per se, but may have been interrupted by tool use. And tool use is a big assumption on the part of SETI. Mm. You know, we really assume that they build a radio telescope. Yeah. Is that necessary? <laughs> um, that's a good question. When you, when you look at the history of the telescope, just incidentally, is you used to think that light came from the eye. Then it, the Arab world enters the you know, Middle Ages in Europe, and what's coming out of the Arab world in two or 300 years is optics and refraction and spectroscopy, and it's like, I'd sure like to know what happened, because that would say, is a species that uses tools going to absolutely build a radio telescope? Happened with us, but does it have to happen? So things like that are things that I think you can answer specific questions along the Drake equation. Uh, you're a historian that can translate Arab texts from Timbuktu, come to SETI. <laughs> Linda Ray, I think I might, or we might have you run, there's some in the back, have you run up and down these stairs a bit. I, I see a pink shirt. Yes, yes. It's very smart to wear a bright colored shirt. Yes, pink. <laughs> yes, or a pink sweater. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Ghosh, and the question I wanted to ask you is uh, one about the wisdom of communicating with a foreign species given. Um, some apocalyptic books and movies that we've uh, we've seen recently. Should I go first this time? Yes. The, the wisdom uh, of. Well, we're already leaking. Did everyone hear that? The, what, yeah. what is the wisdom? Okay. Is it wise to communicate with other species, uh, extraterrestrials? They may be far in advance of us, and so on. And you know, right over here is the Stanford Linear Accelerator and it's shooting neutrinos out over the ocean and into space. So there's this neutrino lighthouse going, woohoo, we're here. <laughs> and there's lots of leaks like that. Planetary radar is a big blast. And of course, we've been le leaking I Love Lucy and, you know, howdy doody, our ambassadors to the stars. <laughs> I think they'd st steer clear if they get howdy doody or bozo the clown, but at any rate. <laughs> The, the point is that uh, listening is what we do at SETI. We don't really transmit, but we are leaking like crazy, and anybody within about 100 light years knows that we have technology by now. Mm -hmm. So is it wise? Well, it's a little late to decide whether we're giving ourselves away or not, mm -hmm. but we do, when I think about it, I think benevolence, uh, in order to, uh, in order to advance, in a civilization and think outwardly, take some kind of sense of harmony of the universe. Mm. So I would say the best thing we can do is listen like crazy because we've already given ourselves away and it's better to be informed than not. And so the one thing we have to cultivate in the human race when you think about extraterrestrials is cuteness. We have to be very cute. <laughs> Practice cuteness. <laughs> I wonder if, oh yeah, may I ask just a quick question if you can give a brief answer to this, because I think this is, this is key. Is the evolution of intelligence inevitable? Is it inevitable? Would it be inevitable, even if there were life somewhere, a, a microbe somewhere else in the, in the universe? Will it necessarily involve, evolve to intelligence? And we'll keep it just, how about just a yes or no answer? <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. I'm going to say if the life form is mobile, uh, yes. Okay. It's inevitable. Okay. What she said. I love that. There's so many, I, so many questions. Okay. I agree. <laughs> Hi, my name's Dave. Um, you, you talk about mobility, but if you time lapse um, root systems of various plants, they behave very intelligently as they sense out nutrients and, and water sources and other things. So I wouldn't just limit it to mobile organisms, you know. 
can. John Muir <laughs> said we travel about as much as trees because we all go around the sun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but good point. Good point. Oh, oh, there's a, a question over here. Yes. I, oh, there are two microphones. I, my Hi. apologies. Okay. Um. Hi, is this a good distance? Can you Hello? hear me? Yes, that is a good distance. We can hear you. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you. I have a biodiversity quiz tomorrow, and so this is like really nice because it's kind of studying. It's about like the Cambrian awesome. explosion and all that. So awesome. thanks. Um, but I also wanted to ask. I kind of have a hypothesis <laughs> that I can't really prove because I'm a high school student with no money. Um, but like. What are your guys' thoughts on, and I know human intervention definitely messes with this, but like um, similar species in different areas, and I think this especially applies to humpback whales, um, and like with things like accents or different languages, like do those exist? Um, and do creatures um, or some like species um, from yeah. different areas that are similar or the same have like accents or languages from different areas? Yeah, on where I think from. there's a movie called Free Willy, was it, with an orca in it? And uh, I understand that they, they tried to let the orca go, but he'd forgotten how to feed himself, so they recaptured him and fed him and stuff. But mm. what I thought was interesting is they knew where to let him go because he had a Greenland accent. <laughs> so critters do have accents, and you can ID where they grew up. That, but he, you know, just to mention, he never actually found his family. Oh, though, right, that was it. At the project manager for that is the executive director for the Whale Sanctuary Project. Oh, cool. And so he was in Iceland for five years with, with uh, oh, Keiko. Bring it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it was Iceland, and uh, okay. they never actually found his family. Um, that's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to put a whale back with his family after he's been yeah. captive for so long. But they do have accents. They do, yeah. Hey, uh, this is Pramath. Uh, so my question is more on like the type of intelligence, and uh, uh, to a point which you mentioned earlier that uh, the neocortex kind of, and like the gyrophomes, they we sort of think that they came into existence for socialization, and uh, most intelligence is a uh, was a result of socialization or decision making even for mobility. So my question really is like in humans now we have neurodiversity, right? Like we have people who have autism or who are on the Asperger syndrome, and quote unquote some of these are the people we we consider the most intelligent people. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so my question is like on this. Like I, I I don't know exactly how to form this question, but the question is kind of on that this is not uh, what evolution wanted. Evolution wanted us to be socially intelligent, but now we're getting these savants, and not now, but like we've always had them probably. Uh, but like, so just in general, like, it's a broad stroke question on like, where do you think, it, is intelligence going in a direction in human species? Hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone can repeat the essence of that. Well, it sounds like the end was is because we see different. Not every not every human who is highly intelligent has. There are different kinds of communication abilities within humans. I'm I'm looking at you for nodding to make sure that I have this right. Different kinds of communication abilities. So if you're someone who's on the spectrum, you may not be able to have those skills, but could be highly highly intelligent. Yeah. Also, like there was a study recently. Uh, which talked about like Eindhoven. Eindhoven's like the tech hub in Netherlands. And uh, uh, the uh, autism spectrum uh, diagnosis, at least, has gotten much higher in mm. Eindhoven. OK. And, and then your question was, so is there, are we seeing are a change like, in human in intelligence? Maybe it's self-selection the same way you talked about with orcas, right? Like mm. over the last 100 years, or like at least the last 50 years, when white collar jobs have gone uh, and increased, are we now self-selecting people for their IQ? OK. Are there selection pressures uh, for a certain kind of intelligence in play with humans? Um. I understand that Coco the gorilla, they gave her an IQ test. Um, Debbie may be able to confirm this, but it was culturally biased, you know, like what's good to eat? Flour, ice cream, rock. And she picked flour, of course, because she's a gorilla. And, you know, when it rains, you hide in a tree, a rock, a house. She picked a tree. And, you know, so there was a culturally biased test. I don't think it was a fair measure of her IQ, but it does kind of contrast how 
we're still trying to overcome a human sense of intelligence, but your case studies, your cases are interesting examples of intelligence that isn't recognized largely, or like a deeper intelligence, like somebody, uh, remember the Dustin Hoffman movie where he dropped uh, the toothpicks and he said there are 458 of them or something, and there were two missing indeed, you know, but. So in other words, different kinds of intelligence and recognition and patterns and so on. Is and that think going part to happen of, with humans? And part of this is there's selection pressure now on humans, right? right that's selecting for us a, a kind of intelligence, a different kind of intelligence. I think that's a really interesting concept. I don't think that it's necessarily the case, though, because although, I mean, really, when, when it comes to evolution, it's how many, how, much, how many of your genes can you push into the next generation? I mean, that's, that's the, the currency mm -hmm. of evolution and natural selection. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how intelligent you are or anything like that. It's just, or how many jobs there are and, and all of that. It matters how many kids you have who survive into the next generation to have kids. Um, and that, that's the bottom line for evolution. I think we have one, we're going in the center here. I'm wondering um, if you look at efforts to design intelligent uh, systems for inspiration to learn about the evolution of intelligence. And I, I see you get a lot of inspiration. Can you bring your microphone up just a little yeah. bit? I see you get a lot of inspiration from looking at other parts of the animal kingdom and maybe even the plant kingdom. And But I'm wondering if the reverse also applies and what kinds of general lessons you've learned. Yeah, we just had a powwow on that, on machine learning, neural nets, and so on. Do you, As, can, you rep sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry, just yeah. Can we derive lessons and all from, you're saying, artificial intelligence, basically? Efforts to design. And efforts to design that, yeah. yeah. I think, uh, personally, I, I think quantum computers are going to come a lot closer to a human kind of intelligence than uh, larger and larger classical computers, uh, in part because the electrons in the brain synapses don't exist as particles until they're observed. So there's this intimate relationship between consciousness and particles that we haven't fully explored. So I think <clears throat> I agree that neural nets and that kind of deriving uh, intelligence that way is it's still in its infancy. Uh, it's really neat that people are e do, making efforts to do this. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to add quantum computers to the mix. Uh, so yes, and it's encouraging and it may be taken in such steps that we begin to understand things we couldn't understand without having taken those steps to, toward artificial intelligence. Like that. Maybe we'll have one more question or, or two. I okay, see I saw a tentative hand. I'm, I'm drawn oh, to the... T oh, over here. Yes, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, oh, yes, sorry. Um, I have a question. Sorry. <laughs> the light's right in my eye. Has SETI or does SETI um, put effort into trying to find alien signals where the aliens may be trying to conceal them? Um, the background is, from what, what I read one time, is that certain type of orcas chase other... Uh, mammals and use a different sort of echolocation, so they hide their communication in the sh son sonic shadow of their prey, and that sounds very advanced to me. And yeah. does SETI try to look for aliens that are hiding? You know, thinking that the successful ones aren't broadcasting like we are. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Um, I think we should broaden the search as wide as we can. Uh, for example, this isn't directly to your question, but Mars has a natural microwave laser in its atmosphere. If you surround Mars with mirrors, you get optical SETI. You can send interstellar messages, and it's pumped by the sun, so the energy's free. Now that's an example of something we would have missed, but now with Kepler, we know which systems have a planet in the habitable zone, and if they also have a Mars, with CO2, then there's a great target for optical SETI. And so, not necessarily hiding, but there are lots of techniques for SETI. What if we build the first real quantum computer and a message appears in there? 
Well, that means the extraterrestrials will have been teleporting information, which makes sense for a very advanced civilization, but we will not have looked there yet. Another one is orbital angular momentum of photons. It's a newly discovered way of wrapping information in one photon is curling it. And each curl is a bit. And they, in the lab, they've managed to make orbital, photon orbital angular momentum with 40 winds. That means a trillion piece of information with 40 bits. So, etc. So, I think they might not necessarily be hiding, but we've hardly begun to break the surface of SETI, kinds of SETI to do. I'd like to ask a question, and then there's a certain gen gentleman here who's been very patient. Yes, yes, you have been very patient. But let me ask this because it's an important question to ask with the two researchers who are up here who, who have dedicated their lives to um, the, the welfare of, of other animals. I mean, humans are animals too, right? So we're talking about non-human animals. And I'm wondering, um, now that we see there's a, such a richness of intelligence all around us, what are the ethical implications of being surrounded by these beautiful and remarkable creatures? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think the ethical implications are, are pretty clear. Um, that we need to treat other life forms with respect um, and pretty much leave them alone. Um, while we are both scientists and there may be a lot of uh, life scientists in, the, in this audience, it's really important to find a way to learn about the world, to learn about other species uh, without doing that in a destructive, invasive way. And so mm -hmm. my point is, is that, you know, if we share this planet with other organisms, we need to leave them alone as much as possible. And I think it's, it's, there's a clear ethic there for, for astrobiology as well, that if we find something on another planet that's alive, we're going to be very tempted to get right in there bring it back and do all kinds of stuff with it. And I think we need to start thinking now about what our ethics would be um, once, once we have that experience, because eventually we will find some, someone alive on another planet. And we, we should know how, how to do, deal with that. And certainly you have also dedicated your life to that as a science advocate. So if you follow what Lori Marino does, she is also working very hard to reduce the suffering of the intelligent animals among us. And, and Lawrence, do you want to say something about the ethics? Well, um, they used to hunt dinosaurs with dynamite. And, you know, they got some bones, but it pretty much wrecked the site. And the layering was not studyable after that, and so on. And you know, I agree with Lori. You, you learn the most, whether it's an extraterrestrial signal or an orca or anything, leave them alone and study their behavior and stay out of the way as much as possible, mm -hmm. and you'll learn the most. And so instead of getting in there and you know dissecting everything right away, you lose their behavior that way. You lose the context. And, you know, we, we really have to have an ethic in science of backing off and doing the best we can with remote detection. And then we get the culture of orcas. We don't just get pieces of their flesh, you know, and so on. Now, humpback whales, I might add, uh, the humpback whales that do bubble netting are not related because when they jump out, they breach and they splash in the water, they, they uh, shed some skin, and you can do mitochondrial DNA analysis on their skin. And it turns out that the bubble netters are not related. A mother matriarch elephant will teach the family how to forage, and wolves will teach the family how to hunt. Humpback whales form bubble netting guilds based on ability, not on family relationships. So as far as we know, that's the only other animal that forms long-lasting relationships built, built on profession. In other words, professional ability. Mm -hmm. So we may have more in common sociologically with humans than any other animal. But that's an example of backing off and letting them do their behavior mm -hmm. and getting a much richer view of the life of that critter. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to have a one last question to this gentleman who's, I should just say, his, his hand up went, <laughs> went up right away. So the last question, sir. So going back to the beginning of our discussion when we start to talk about our childhood and the questions we asked, I remember going out in the golf course, lying down and trying to find the star immediately at the center of the heavens. And I guess I was thinking about that, but I think I was more trying to feel it. And, and the reason I phrase it that way is because my question is, is a simple one. What's the difference between consciousness? I think I was trying to be conscious of that star. I couldn't intelligent it. So what's the, difference, what's the relationship between, or the difference between consciousness and intelligence? Oh, oh goodness. That, of course, that has to be the you last question, that right? 15. I, I know that we're going to make people sweat if we don't wind it up, although we'd love to keep going. So, yeah, the difference between consciousness and intelligence, briefly. <laughs> Five words or less. Um, well, I would say. Um, well, this, this kind of leaks into my quantum background, but consciousness may be the ability to collapse a wave function. In other words, to make, be an observer. And that's pragmatic, mm. but it's testable in the lab. Mm. So if a wave function collapses, you know, when you look at something that's a quantum wave, it'll turn into a particle when you observe it. it but you need an observer. And maybe consciousness, it could be measured as the ability to collapse a wave function. Now that's just pragmatic, and I know I'm sidestepping the question, but Lori will answer you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that a lot of people have been thinking about for a long time. We have no idea what consciousness is. We know that we have it, um, and that's a very interesting situation. I think all organisms are conscious, because it, it means that it is something like it is there's something to be that it's like to be x y and z um, I, I look at intelligence as being the ability to process information um, now they tend to go hand in hand in organisms on this planet and I think there's a reason for that because we use our brains for both um, but I don't know. I mean, anyone, I, I, you know, obviously, that's the $6 million question, right? And nobody knows what consciousness is. Nobody. Um, we still haven't figured out that problem. Um, so I'm not going to answer it either. <laughs> I, just, I just think that is, that is where the rubber hits the road. So it's a great question. And that gives us something else to ponder. Yes. I want to leave with words that um, Lawrence says in one of his documentary videos, which is lovely, uh, video about his work, that the effort of SETI itself deprovincializes our thought about ourselves and gets you thinking big. It puts us in perspective. And I would say that your statement, Lawrence, um, also applies to our growing understanding of the intelligence of the creatures around us, of, of the animals around us. Mm -hmm. It deprovincializes our thoughts about ourselves and puts human intelligence in perspective. And so I want to thank our guests, um, Lori and Lawrence, for Lawrence Do Doyle and Lori Marino for giving us their perspective of animal intelligence to help us understand our own. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Really good. Thank you.